premiere of the latest from the Rolling Stones. Here's one hit to the body. One hit from the body and one hit from the heart. That's one. Yeah. See that? That's a, that's a current, current song. Too. But it's got bump, bump, do do do. It's got a little jumping mm -hmm. jack flash. Yeah. yeah. Rhythmically, jumping jack flash. Yeah. Yeah. So you try to change the rhythms around. But certain. See, I mean, I just find myself uh, you know, working over those things. There's still. The, you know, I try and find as many songs as I can out of that. I find. Not really consciously, but just. I find myself playing that sequence, and there's still room in there for. Yeah. You know, to say other things in a different way. Left school, I hadn't seen him for about four years or so, and uh, in the meantime, that's when I'd started, I was going to art school and I picked up guitar, and I got heavily into Chuck Berry and Muddy Waters and, and stuff, you know, Jimmy Reed, and uh, one day, by it just uh, there was Mick again, who I'd known for, you know, since he was, we, I think, four years old, was, Time that we can remember, we can trace it back to the you know, yeah. BC. <laughs> but um, he was under his arm. He had his uh, chess records, his Chuck Berry album. He had a Chuck up. Berry album under his arm yeah, on the train. Yeah, two or three of them. In fact, yeah. he was incredibly jealous. And, uh, and so, in other words, we re-met and found out that in the meantime, we both developed the same taste in music, and also. A He'd been like doing his uh, little bit with some amateur band, you know, mm -hmm. pretending to be Elvis and Buddy Holly like we all do. We do, well, yeah. did, <laughs> and probably still do. But um, and there, you know, I just opened the door, I opened the carriage, got in the train, and there's Mick with these albums, you know. So then we got to talking, and uh, and I wanted to know where he got them from because they were American pressings, you know, they weren't yeah. English. <laughs> so. Uh, and, and since we'd been hanging around from four to four years old until we were 11, until we happened to go to different schools, um, it, it was, it was, I mean, it was one of those things that you can't deny it, you know, it's one of the, this has to happen, you know. So I wanted to know where he got the records and he was into singing and then, you know, on the train ride he found that, oh, yeah, I played a little guitar, so we got back together, you know, and used to sort of drive our parents berserk. Yeah. That, but it was yeah. a Chuck Berry record that let you know. Yeah, that you yeah, rocking at the hops. On the same yeah. wavelength. Yeah. If she knew what she wants. There was a bass of all song and a riff, and that's a song that's got about 5,000 riffs, all, all, all hooks, classic hooks, all put together. How did, how do you come up with those? Where, where did 19 Nervous Breakdown come from? I think uh, I was really, uh, at the time, I was scared I was going to forget them if I didn't, throw, you know, use them all at once. Yeah. You know, I mean, uh... Well, that one's got, I mean, it's got a bass riff. Yeah, boom, down. Mm. Courtesy so there, of Bo Diddley. And, uh... Well, came, from Bo, came from Bo Diddley, that thing? Yeah, Diddley Dan, yeah. That, was, that uh, tune, Diddley Dan? Yeah. yeah. And, and I mean, it was really like a kind of trip. There's a thing know, that happens yeah. on the top. It's the memory. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah and then the. Yeah. Here comes your nineteen. Kind of a yeah. satisfaction thing. Yeah. yeah. It was all because it was all around the same time I was coming. I mean, it seemed sometimes that I kept rewriting stories, but to me it seemed like that. I mean, and um, and they just kept piling out these riffs, and I thought, wow, right. you know, let's try and put as many into one song as possible. And then put too many in, you probably have a nervous breakdown or something. <laughs>
toured England, you guys were, were his opening act. Being on the tour with myself and Bo Diddley and the Everly Brothers um, through England, Mick Jagger was opening the show with us. He had a van, he and Keith and the rest of the group, and they were sleeping in the van, and Mick Jagger started sleeping on our floor. It was the most terrifying moment of my life, really, I think. Um, six weeks around England with Bo Diddley, the Everly Brothers were top of the bill, and Little Richard. I mean, we probably learned more in those six weeks from Richard. You know, we used to watch him. We do our bit and sort of slowly got used to sort of the size of the stage and the, the expansion, the audience. And everything. But what we'd really do, I mean, we didn't really look forward to playing on that stage because we figured that we were a club band. And uh, what we really looked forward to was like getting our bit out of the way and then watching those guys yeah. work. You know, and we'd be hanging from rafters and we'd find little places so we got a good viewpoint and how they did it and like, we'd watch everything, you know. I mean, if they'd had video cameras in those days, then we <laughs> Started coming, I, you know, I, I was, uh, I just wait by the radio as well and let's see that first, but all the Buddy Hollis at the first, yeah. but, you know, uh, Little Richard, Chuck Berry, of course, you know. Bo Diddley, Eddie Cochran, and a lot of the doo-wop stuff, you know. Doo-wop, like that New York yeah, stuff? Yeah, yeah, the, you know, the, the harmonies, the vocals, uh -huh. and the, uh, you know, Earth Angel. That's one that you haven't really, uh, to my knowledge, you never really explored too much with the Stones, doo-wop. I mean, you went... And it to... can't hold a harmony. Really. Ah. <laughs> How about that? I couldn't have dreamed that one up. You seem to have a, a, an uncanny talent for coming up with a simple riff and writing a song around the, the catchiest riff imaginable. You know, like, and, it, and it becomes it like a simple guy. Is that what it is? <laughs> Satisfaction, for instance. I mean, you can't. You know, that yeah. that thing will endure forever. Bum, bum, ba, na, na. Where does the thing like that? Where does the thing? I'll like tell that you come where from? it comes from. You know, and then I'll tell you how dumb I am by not recognizing them when they come. Um, the first time I ever could have afford it was in London to stay in a Hilton hotel. <laughs> I mean, the London Hilton. And uh, I'd got one of the early first cassette players, you know, the little tiny, mm -hmm. just the real sort of straight off the drawing board almost at that time. This is about 65. Um, and I thought, well, this is a handy gadget, yeah. And uh, so I had that, and I had you know, the, the trusty old axe next to the bed, and I was asleep. And, I mean, this is, talking about how Star Wars come, I, I just woke up in the middle of the night. Da, 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 da. Uh, middle of the night? Yeah, middle of the night. Straight out of sleep, pushed me record button, put it down on tape. Must remember this, you know, and listen to it over breakfast, right? Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I got maybe like one verse and the riff down, you know. And uh, anyway, the next day I wake up and the tape is like finished, you know. So I order up my Hilton breakfast, my friend. Yeah, it's a big deal for me at the yeah. time. <laughs> and uh, yeah, sheer luxury. And uh, so I run it back and push the button. And sure enough, there at the beginning is satisfaction. Yeah. And then there's 45 minutes of me snoring. <laughs> Stick around, we got some great music and the story of Chuck Berry throwing Keith off stage when we come back. So, you just recently were in Chicago playing with Chuck Berry. 
25 yeah. years later. Yeah, at last he allowed me. <laughs> I was, well, that must have been... That was, it was great. It was only it was a few days ago, you know. Uh, I mean, Chuck, I mean, he was my man, you know, uh, and... Uh, and I've had my ups and downs with Chuck over the years. Yeah. I've heard about this. Now, this is interesting because the guy who, who actually really influenced you to start playing guitar brought, really brought you and Mick together because yeah. Mick was carrying it out. True. Now, then, there's an interesting story about, was it the first time you met Chuck? Or the first time you were on stage with him? No, no, no. The first time, I was, it must have been sometime in the 60s, and he threw me off. Threw you off the stage? Yeah, I was playing too loud for him. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. People that were being kind said I was playing too good. Yeah. But I don't, he said well, it I was too loud. I wouldn't, I wouldn't try to answer that question. <laughs> no, I But then not. what about, was it the Ritz or a club in New York? Um, Did he bash you? Oh, oh yeah. He gave me a black eye. Yeah. He's, uh, he's now waiting for me to give him a white one. with the story of Keith's first guitar lesson and an exclusive Friday Night Video's live version of Sleep Tonight from the new Stones album. granddad used to put it in the, in my hand when I was that big. He, he, I, he had ambitions for me and uh, for absolutely no reason. Cause he, was, he was a musician but fairly lousy. And so what, did you, what was your early repertoire as a kid? I mean, was this... uh, he tried to teach me um, Malaguena. Oh yeah, <laughs> Spanish guitar. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, he tried to, t he tried to teach me that stuff. And um, I could never understand why. I mean, I, I mean, I loved it. I always thought the guitar lived on top of the piano in his house. Yeah. And, uh, but I, I only found out a little while ago that, uh, in actual fact, he used to keep it real stashed away. You know, you bring it out when I came, uh, when he knew I was coming to visit, you know. Yeah. I had a similar experience. My, my parents got me into playing the piano immediately, as, as early as they could, would sit me down at the piano and get me to play. But it wasn't really until rock and roll hit the radio up in Canada, where I was, that I all of a sudden was galvanized and said, this is what I wanted to do. Same thing with you. What was the song that you first heard that made you want to play rock and roll? The f well, it was the first rock and roll record I heard. And I think in England it was, uh, it, for, I know what it was for me. I think it's probably the first one they ever played in. It was Heartbreak Hotel. Heartbreak Hotel. That was a big one. And that was, uh, boom, one minute, a desert out there, you know, and the next minute here comes an oasis, you know, and if you were interested in playing that, that was the spark. Yeah. And now, as promised, sleep tonight. You better get some sleep tonight. Baby. You better get some sleep tonight. back with more of Friday Night Videos. You gotta get him out of that.
That tune start me up. That's a great riff. Oh, yeah. Is that a, was that one of those weird tunings? Um, it was. Uh, it was. Both it originally no, it wasn't. But the the final version turned out. I, I, I used. Right. You know, I I just used the tuning because. Yeah. Uh, is a tone drop, you know, uh -huh. I left the other chord out of that <laughs> because, um, but it's still the same thing, I love, I love all drops and, uh, and that's a kind of a bow diddly kind of a yeah, thing, yeah, very it? much, yeah. yeah, yeah, it is in actual fact, yeah. yeah, so it just shows, boy, those old tricks, like you were saying before, yeah, there's nothing new under the sun when it comes to, that. there's one song, and, uh, um, and all we do, I think, is, is, is make, you know, make the changes and the variations, yeah, yeah. great, don't go away. Paul and I'll be right back. And he's got a record out called You Don't Have to Take Our Claws Off. Not